Um, so we have Ann Kitajima here with us today. She is the Assistant Director of the Morro Bay National Estuary Program. And um, her responsibilities there include grant writing and grant management, strategic planning and administrative functions. Uh, for 15 years, she managed the monitor, monitoring program um, for the organization for the Morro Bay National Estuary Program. And she continues to provide support in monitoring, planning and protocol development. So we are so excited to welcome Anne. Uh, you know, the National, uh, Morro Bay National Estuary Program is one of our, one of my favorite partners in Morro Bay um, to work with because we have just been able to collaborate on so many fun projects. Like whether it's day camps or junior ranger programs, we've had their staff come out and offer some really high quality programming to our visitors. And uh, I'm just so excited to have you here today, Anne. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to do this. Really appreciate it. Of course, thanks Robin. So um, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you can join us. Um, so just a quick word about who we are. Um, so the Morro Bay National Estuary Program is a nonprofit. And we are, um, our goal is to protect and restore Morro Bay for people and for wildlife. So every three years, we gather all available data and we compile an environmental report card called the State of the Bay. And the idea there is to answer the questions that we are commonly asked, especially by members of the public. So we're trying to answer questions like, is it safe to eat shellfish? Um, what is the bay filling in with sediment? You know, those types of questions that were um, often asked and we try to answer them in a public friendly manner. So the full report has nine different indicator questions. Um, today I'm gonna to present the re results for four of those questions. So first, just a little bit about the area where we work. Um, so um, this is the Morro Bay Estuary. Here's Morro Rock. Here's the city of Morro Bay and the community of Los Osos. This dotted red line, that's the watershed boundary. So that means that that's the area of land that drains into Morro Bay. So this is Highway 1 here. So here's slow. So if you're leaving Highway 1, when you pass that big hill at the bottom of which is the California men's colony, that's the watershed boundary right there. So this is Choro Creek. It starts in the hills up above the men's colony, and then it parallels Highway 1, and then it empties out into the bay around the State Park Marina. And then on the Los Osos side, this is Los Osos Valley Road. Um, and the boundary here, if you're familiar with that area, is the Highland Ranch um, entrance is right around the watershed boundary. And so this is Warden Creek that parallels Los Osos Valley Road. And then we have Los Osos Creek that starts up in Clark Valley and it comes down out of the hills. It crosses Los Osos Valley Road at the Bear Statue for those of you that are locals. And then those two creeks meet up. They go under the South Bay Boulevard Bridge and then they empty into the bay. So the estuary is approximately 2,300 acres, and then the whole watershed is about 75 square miles. So the first indicator I'm gonna be talking about today is safe swimming. So a lot of people wanna be able to swim or paddle or sail in Morro Bay. Um, if they're doing those types of activities and they accidentally ingest some water, and if that water is contaminated with pathogens, then they could become ill. So pathogens are things like bacteria, viruses, and protozoa that can cause illness. Now, unfortunately, there are hundreds of things that could potentially make you ill, and it's impossible for us to test for every single one of them. So instead, we test for what are called indicator bacteria, and those are bacteria that tend to be present when fecal contamination is present. So in the Bay, we test for enterococcus. Um, you may have heard of E. coli. That's a common indicator for freshwater but it doesn't work very well in marine waters because it's sensitive to salt. The salt tends to kill it off. So the time frame of data I'll be showing you today goes from 2005 to 2018. So how does bacteria get into a water body like Morro Bay? So um, say there's a boat and that boat has a waste holding tank. If that tank has a leak or if the owner deliberately empties their tank, um, that can introduce bacteria into the bay. Wildlife can be a source, so marine mammals and birds. Um, runoff from um, 
livestock operations can be a source, um, as well as runoff that's carrying pet waste from urban areas. And then septic systems and sewage treatment plants, if they're operating properly, they should not be sources of bacteria. So it's only if there's something unusual, like say a sewage spill that you might um, see bacteria coming from these sources. So how do we monitor bacteria in the Bay? So we have um, some dedicated volunteers. They go out once a month. Um, they collect samples from eight sites around the Bay shoreline using sterile technique. And then they take those samples to the Morro Bay Cayucas Wastewater Treatment Plant Lab and they process them for enterococcus. Then they incubate them overnight. They return the next day and then they interpret the results. So this map shows the eight locations. Each dot represents one of the monitoring sites. We specifically selected these sites because these are places where people most frequently tend to access the water. So Coleman Beach, Tidelands Park, Windy Cove, State Park Marina, Pasadena Point, Baywood Pier, Cuesta Inlet, and Sharks Inlet. And so the color of each dot indicates the bacteria status of the site. And so they all have a score of very good or good, which basically equates to a grade of an A or a B for bacteria. But regardless of how clean the, um, those areas typically are, after a storm, it's recommended that you stay out of the water for 72 hours because the bacteria is always bad after a storm. And this is according to Surfrider and Heal the Bay. So we are involved in a project to help keep bacteria out of the bay. It's called the Mutts for the Bay program. So if you've been to a park recently or if you've strolled the Embarcadero, you've seen these dispensers. Um, they, have, they contain plastic bags that are free and available to pet owners so that they can pick up after their pets. So we, are, um, we maintain a network of 31 dispensers around the bay. And our role in the program is to accept donations from private citizens. Um, sometimes businesses or civic organizations will sponsor a dispenser. And so we collect the funds. Um, we order these bags by the pallet. And we distribute boxes of them to our volunteers. And then our volunteers go out and they restock those dispensers so that there are always bags available for people. So last year in 2019, over 350,000 bags were given out. And so that's quite a bit of bacteria that was prevented from reaching the bay. So next I'm gonna talk about eelgrass. So eelgrass is a flowering plant that puts down roots in our bay bottom. And we consider it to be a very valuable habitat because it serves quite a few important functions in our bay. But unfortunately we've experienced catastrophic loss over the last decade or so. So this illustration shows um, what underwater eelgrass might look like in our bay. Um, so a little bit about the functions that eelgrass serves in our bay. So as I mentioned, it's a plant that puts down roots. So those roots help hold the bay bottom in place. So when the waves come, instead of the loose sediment being stirred up and causing the water to get cloudy, the waters will stay clear. So eelgrass helps improve water quality. Um, when the eelgrass is submerged, those blades float up and they form a kind of underwater meadow. And so that's a great place for wildlife to hang out, um, to hide from predators, and to find food. Um, eelgrass is a plant, which means it undergoes photosynthesis. And so that means a byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. So the, it's a plant that's putting oxygen out into the water. So that's good for everything that lives there. And then eelgrass also serves as a direct food source for some wildlife, um, for example, the black brant goose. So these are some images from Morro Bay. Um, on the left, this here is an underwater view of eelgrass in Morro Bay. Um, this guy here, we were out doing some eelgrass monitoring. Um, I believe he was pretty happy in the eelgrass till the tide went out pretty fast on him and stranded him. Um, and then this is a black brant goose. Um, they summer in the Alaska tundra, and then they migrate down to Baja for the winters. And so they like to stop in Morro Bay on the way and fatten up on eelgrass. So you can see this guy has got um, a blade of eelgrass in his beak. 
So this series of maps shows eelgrass over time in our bay. So this bright green color represents eelgrass. Um, and so um, unfortunately what you see over time is this decrease in eelgrass that we've been experiencing. So um, in 2007, we had a peak acreage of 344 acres. And by 2017, we had less than 15 acres. So one um, bright note is that late in 2016, we started seeing these small patches of eelgrass popping up in areas where we had not seen eelgrass for several years. And since then, we've just seen those patches continue to grow and expand. So um, it's, that's definitely been um, some good news on the eelgrass front. Um, and then in 2019, in late 2019, we had another one of these flights flown to gather the data to create this map. Um, and so the map's not complete yet, but the initial analysis shows a nice increase in eelgrass from 2017. So we're really excited to see those numbers and of course we'll share them um, as soon as they're available. So a project we're involved in to make a difference for eelgrass um, is our eelgrass restoration effort. So eelgrass continues to do well in um, some portions of the bay, particularly in the front bay. So Coleman Beach, for instance, and Tidelands Park. So what we do is we go out at low tides on foot by hand, we collect eelgrass. So you pull it out and you make sure you have some of the root on the plant. And then we take it to the mid and back bay to areas where we've had um, the eelgrass, eelgrass loss. And then we plant that eelgrass, we transplant it just similarly to what you might do with plants in your yard. So the way we plant it is we take two eelgrass plants and we crisscross them and then we anchor them in place with one of these U-shaped garden stakes. So this photo on the left shows eelgrass immediately right after we planted it back in 2019. So this here is a PVC square made out of um, or a, a, that we call a quadrat and it's what measures one meter by one meter. And within each of these, we plant 72 eelgrass plants. And so then on the photo on the right, it's taken a year later in 2020, you can see that original one meter by one meter quadrat and you can see how much that original 72 plants expanded beyond the original area where we planted it. So overall, we're seeing really good success with our experimental um, restoration work. And so some of the next steps. Um, so prior to this year, all of our transplanting was done in these, you know, on foot in these um, low tide conditions in the in the inner tidal zone. But um, this year we had a little extra money. And so we decided to try some deeper, some plantings in subtidal areas, so a little bit deeper. And so that work had to be done via scuba. So we just completed that work a couple weeks ago and we'll be monitoring it through the spring and fall to see how it does. And so we're really excited about that. It's if we have success then that could really expand the areas in which we could plant. Um, and then also we were fortunate to receive a couple of grants that are gonna fully fund our eelgrass work for 2021. So we're very excited. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, um, I'm gonna talk about creek health now. So each spring we conduct bioassessment monitoring and that's where we go into our local creeks and we collect bug larvae. And the types of bugs you find give you information about the water quality in that creek. So some types of bugs are extremely um, sensitive to pollution. So if you find those in your creek, then you know it's likely that the water quality is pretty good. And then other kinds of bugs are extremely tolerant of pollution. They can live in the worst possible conditions. So if that's all you find, then it's likely that your water quality is not very good. And the reason we care so much about the bugs is because if it's healthy bug habitat, then that means it's also healthy fish habitat. And we're very interested in um, protecting habitat and um, helping the um, steelhead trout recover in our area. They used to be abundant on the central coast and now their numbers have dwindled. So um, part of the reason for the focus on the bugs is because bugs are fish food. And so if we've got a lot of great bugs, it's, it means we have good habitat that might help bring back the fish. So um, as I mentioned, we do this monitoring every spring. 
Um, so these folks here are collecting habitat measurements. So they're trying to get a sense of whether the creek provides good habitat for bugs and fish. So they measure things like the depth of water in the creek. Um, they measure, they, they make observations of what the bottom of the creek is like. They look overhead to see how much tree canopy there is. And so they're trying to get a sense of um, whether it's high quality habitat. And then this person is collecting a bug sample. So you, what you do is you put this net in the creek and then you stir up the area in front of the net. You scrub all the rocks, you mix up the sediment, in the bottom and what you're basically doing is sloughing off the bug larvae so that they float with the current into your net and then you scoop them up you put them in a jar you add some preservative you ship it to a taxonomy lab and then um, they analyze that for um, basically they sort they count and they, they identify everything in your sample and then they send us a report and then they also take some really great photos so this fellow here is a um, stonefly from our watershed and stoneflies indicate good water quality. So this map um, shows each creek with, and it's color coded with its bug score. And so these scores are averages of scores um, basically of all the available data. And so some of these sites have scores going back to the mid 1990s. So on the Choro Creek side, um, Upper Choro and then Lower Choro down here have fair scores. And then these smaller creeks that drain to Choro, they're called tributaries, and they ha have scores in the good or fair range. So what kind of stands out on the Choro side is Middle Choro, which has a score of only poor. So a couple things going on there. Um, there's a wastewater treatment plant that is discharging its treated effluent to that um, section of the creek. So that water may not have um, the kind of water quality that the most sensitive bugs like. And then the other thing going on is a natural occurring thing there. Um, it's that the gradient through that section of the creek is pretty low, meaning it's pretty flat through there. So as water is going through that area, it slows down and that gives sediment time to drop out. And so that means the bottom of the creek through that area might be a little siltier than it is elsewhere where the water keeps moving more quickly. So in combination, those things um, seem to be having uh, negative impacts on the bug scores. And then on the Los Osos side, Upper Los Osos Creek has excellent bug scores. It has great habitat, it has great water quality. Lower Los Osos and Warden Creek um, are colored gray because we don't have any bug scores for those areas. But based on what we know of the water quality in those areas, our best guess is that the bug scores probably wouldn't be great. Okay, so a project we're involved in to um, help make a difference um, as far as habitat for fish in, and of course bugs is um, this fish barrier removal project on Pennington Creek. So Pennington is one of those tributaries to Choro. Um, it's across from um, Cuesta um, College on Highway 1. And so this creek has great water quality. It has fabulous habitat. So unfortunately, if there are barriers in the creek that fish can't get past, then they can't access that great water and great habitat. So I believe originally there was a waterfall here that fish couldn't jump over. And so we, uh, so people put in a fish passage structure that was supposed to help fish. I think they were supposed to jump up this series of baffles um, to get to the um, creek on the other side. Um, and, but over time, unfortunately, this structure had silted in and so it was no longer passable for fish. Instead, it had become a barrier for fish to get by. So the project was a Trout Unlimited project that we were a partner on. And so it involved removing this barrier. And then this is the after photo. And so basically this creek was very carefully graded so that even in low flow conditions in the summer, it would remain passable for fish. There'd be enough water for fish to get through here. And so by removing this barrier, we were able to open up access to miles of high quality habitat upstream. Okay, so the last indicator I'm going to talk about today is climate change. So um, these, this list is the list of physical effects that are um, expected to occur with changing climate. 
So the first one, increased storminess, um, what that means is storms are expected to become more unpredictable. So they might be bigger, of course they might also be smaller, but they might be bigger, they might last longer, they might happen in times of year that we're not used to, so you know, earlier than usual or later than usual, um, and just and be more intense. So the risk there, of course, is that those more intense storms would be more destructive. Um, we're expecting increasing temperatures. So models show that in Morro Bay, the um, average maximum daily temperature would increase by six and a half degrees Fahrenheit within the next 50 years. Um, increasing drought is another expected effect. So again, models looking at Morro Bay show that um, on average, we would have two and a half inches, um, a reduction of two and a half inches in the average rainfall per year by within the next 50 years. So more drought means more wildfire. And then we're also expecting sea levels to rise, oceans to acidify, increased flooding and saltwater intrusion. So, um, I wanted to give you an example of how we may already be seeing the physical effects of climate change. Um, and this is an example that hit the central coast pretty hard. So as you, I'm sure you all know, the West was um, uh, caught in an intense drought period. Um, and then in, um, which of course, increased drought leads to increased wildfires. And so in late 2017, um, there was the Thomas fire, which at the time was a historically huge fire. Unfortunately, we've had larger ones since then, but at the time it was the biggest. Um, and so the fires like that take out all the vegetation on steep hillsides and, and that vegetation is help holding the soil in place. So then unfortunately this area experienced an extremely intense storm in early January of 2018. So gauges showed that up to half an inch of rain was falling within a five minute period. So you have this combination of intense rain running down these hills and then you no longer have the vegetation that would help hold the hills in place. So there ended up um, a huge um, flood of water and mud formed. Um, it was said to be up to 15 feet deep at some points and traveled as fast as 20 miles per hour. And so that wall of mud and water went tearing through the Montecito neighborhood. It um, killed over 20 people and it caused millions of dollars of property damage. Um, so this is just gives you an idea of how um, potential climate change effects could have impacts on humans. So another expected um, impact from climate change is sea level rise. So we've already experienced an increase in the average sea level of eight to nine inches over the past hundred years. And models show at least a foot of global average sea level rise by the end of this century. So ocean levels rise for a, a few reasons. So one is that so temperatures are rising and oceans act as a, as a sink, as a repository for a lot of that heat. So the oceans are absorbing the um, heat and warm water um, takes up more space than cold water. It's called thermal expansion. So warming oceans mean that the sea levels are going to rise. And then the other thing going on is the ice sheets um, melting. So the um, Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets melting add more water and that also raises sea levels. So the amount of sea level rise we end up experiencing depends on greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a diagram um, that NOAA put together. Um, and so across the bottom here, we have years. And up on this side, we have the change in sea level in meters. So this black line and gray line here, these are measured sea levels, you know, actual observed data. And then on the right, this is looking into the future and trying to see what sea level rise might look like. So if greenhouse gas emissions stay at this level, there's a corresponding expected amount of sea level rise. So these, um, the emissions 
um, levels that you would need to um, keep your emissions down around this level are the levels similar to the levels set in the Paris Treaty, which was a global climate um, uh, treaty that um, President Obama signed. And so that calls for emissions to be reduced as soon as possible and for everyone to be carbon neutral by the second half of the century. So, you know, very ambitious climate goals. And if we were able to achieve that, then we're talking about less than half a meter of sea level rise. If we're looking at the intermediate, the more intermediate scenarios for emissions, that corresponds to emissions rising until the middle of the century and then starting to drop off so that they reach 1990 levels by the end of the century. And if that's the case, then we might experience somewhere between a meter to a meter and a half of sea level rise. And then on the high extreme end here, that corresponds to emissions scenarios where the emissions continue to rise till the middle of the century, and then they flatten out in the second half of the century, but they don't decrease. And so if that's where we end up, then we're talking about two to two and a half meters of sea level rise by the end of the century. So, um, of course, those of us living on the coast, um, especially, are very concerned about what these places we love might look like in the future. Um, so USGS created a model called COSMOS, and it allows people to look in a very localized way at what the impacts of climate change might be on their local area. And this information is available via their Our Coast, Our Future website. So I decided to zoom in a little bit on Morro Bay and see how things might look. So you can set how you can set different levels of um, sea level rise in this scenario. So I went um, went for it and said, okay, fine, let's see what two meters of sea level rise looks like. So remember, that's one of the more extreme emission scenarios. So here we're looking at two meters of sea level rise plus a hundred year storm surge on top of that. So a hundred year storm means it's a storm that's relatively rare. It's a big storm. It doesn't happen that often. On average, it would happen once every hundred years. And so, you know, storms bring winds and they bring big waves. And so that's what this is showing. If you had two meters of sea level rise plus the big waves of a hundred year storm, what would it look like? So, um, so Morro Bay, uh, sorry, Morro Rock is um, practically an island here. Um, the sand spit has been breached. The water's going over the top. Um, the Embarcadero is underwater. The power plant, you know, the, the three stacks there, those would be underwater. And um, the, this little island down here called Grassy Island would be um, submerged as well. And um, in the southern portion of the bay, so much of the Los Oso shoreline is underwater. Um, State Park Marina, some of the golf courses underwater. This salt marsh area, which is um, a state park, would be underwater. And then what's happening here is flooding up Los Osos Creek. So this is all farmland here. And so this is, you know, salt water pushing up here and potentially um, poisoning farmland that's further upstream. So Thinking about the future and what we might be able to do to make a difference, um, I thought it was most effective to just show you this graph again. Um, the idea being that if we don't do anything to control emissions, we are going to end up up here and then we're talking about a really catastrophic amount of sea level rise. Whereas if we are able to moderate emissions um, and bring them down, then we might be, then we might end up with a much more manageable level of sea level rise in the future. So um, what can you do to help protect our bay? So big one, pick up after your pet. Um, as I explained, people want to be able to swim in the bay. There are oyster farms there. People want to be able to eat those oysters and they can only do that if we have clean water. Um, watch what goes down the storm drain. Um, there are um, so when it, when it rains in your neighborhood, um, that rain, it travels down our streets and gutters and sidewalks and yards, and it ends up in the nearest storm drain. And then that water goes untreated either to your nearest creek or to the bay itself. So it's really important that you don't use those storm drains like a trash can. 
And then the last thing is doing your best to reduce your carbon footprint um, so that we can all um, have a brighter uh, climate future. So we hope you will connect with us. Um, come to our nature center, um, not right now because unfortunately it's not open, but it's located on the Embarcadero um, and typically it's open daily for visitors. Um, come to our events in the future. Subscribe to our weekly blog. That's a great source of, um, you can find out about our events. You can see what's going on in the Bay. Um, there's a field highlight every month so you can see what our staff is up to in the field. And they always have interesting wildlife sightings and things like that. Um, and then you can follow us on social media. So hopefully I've piqued your interest. As I said, I only gave you information on four of the nine indicators. So there's information on five more. Um, and so if you would like to learn more, um, if you Google Morro Bay, State of the Bay, I'm sure it will take you to the right place. Um, you can access our full printed version of the report. Um, and then we also on the website have expanded web content. So, um, you know, everything you want to include never fits in the printed version so we have an online version that has additional data and then there's also a short video on each topic um, in case you you know just want the highlights so thank you very much um, and